everybody. I'm about to watch me a good old military propaganda film. Scarlet's like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> you wanna say hi, Scarlet? It's Scarlet, everybody. Scarlet wants to say hello. Oh. Say hi. Those cameras that way. In all seriousness, I actually really love stuff like this. I really love older, like, black and white stuff, whether it's movies or TV shows or films like this. I've seen a lot of, like, the, the films that they made, like, in the 1940s, like, teaching you how to do, like, how to be a good citizen and how to do things. But this one is going to be an American one made about the UK. And according to the Imperial War Museum's description of it, it is the first in a series of US information films introducing the American soldier to the habits and customs of Great Britain, one of their closest allies. So this should be really interesting. <laughs> I'm curious to hear from all of you Brits in the uh, in the comments letting me know how accurate this is. But yeah, because I know in World War II the American soldiers were stationed in Britain kind of leading up to, to D-Day. So I guess they had to prepare the American soldiers who probably had never even been outside the United States, maybe not even been outside their town or their state. You know, they had to prepare them for living in this foreign country. It's like a foreign country that's similar to the US in some ways, but also probably really different in a lot of ways as well. So just kind of preparing them for the culture shock a little bit and making sure that they understand the customs of the UK and, you know, hopefully don't cause any uh, uh, scenes or whatever. <laughs> and I know that still today there are a lot of U.S. soldiers that are stationed in the U.K. Um, I think the U.S. rents out bases from the UK or even had some of their own. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but I, I do know that there are quite a few bases still in the in the UK where Americans live and uh, live in the, the cities there along with the civilians. So I guess a lot of this might even extend into today. But I do want to say that this is a Patreon request from Scott Andrew McNamara. Now I just did one of his two or three days ago as well, but I kind of wanted to do one that was sort of like US and UK related today, so this kind of covers both bases, and so I thought it was a good one to go ahead and do. And also this uh, video is from the channel US and National Archives, so I guess they have a lot of like older footage like this. Probably kind of similar to the British Path archives or whatever it's called that the UK has, so. All right, well without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into this one. It's uh, 42 minutes, so it's not a short video, but I, uh, I don't mind doing these longer videos on my channel. All right, let's go ahead and let's jump into you. Let's see what the heck this video is about. All right, let's see what these American soldiers were taught about the UK in 1942 or something. What song is that? interesting to watch some of these other films too. I don't know who they're about, but okay. <laughs> Good football footage. Don't even have face mask in it. Guns? That game wasn't won by the man who made that touchdown. It was won by a team, and every man on the team had a share in winning it. We're playing another kind of a game now, only this one isn't for fun. It's for keeps. And this game won't be won by any single player either. It'll be won by a team a team called the United Nations. The ball will be carried by the men in the backfield. The tough little guy from China, Big Joe Russia, John Britton, and a guy called Yank, the four greatest backs in the world. All right. So let's take a look at the men who carry the ball with us. Who are they? How do they live? What makes them tick? Let's start with the one that's toughest to understand. 
the one we know just enough about to confuse us, John how, Britton. How is Britain more tough to understand than like the Russians, for instance, for for a United States citizen? Like that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> Nothing against the Russians. It's just that America is much more closely tied with Britain than it is Russia. I think everybody knows that. So that's a really weird thing to say, but okay. Here's where he lives. A little island no larger than the state of Idaho. Oh. Half a million people live it's in Idaho. Larger. 96 times that many live in Britain. The Natchez and the Japs scream about Lebensraum, living nice. space. But there are more people on a square mile of Britain than a square mile of Germany or Italy or Japan. More congestion than practically any place on earth except the New York subway or a sardine can. Okay. And that's a clue that explains a lot about John Britton. We build front porches on our houses because we didn't want to miss the chance to see our neighbors. But John Britton hides himself in a little box and plants a hedge around that to make sure he doesn't. Living that close to neighbors, privacy is part of the pursuit of happiness. And in the sardine can called Britain, they learn to get on with their neighbors. They have to. He's too damn close. That's what I think there's probably a little bit more truth. Like, there's a nugget of truth in that. Like, I think the Brits do probably value their privacy a little bit more than Americans do. But, I mean, that was a bit of, ex a bit of an extreme example. <laughs> so, okay. That's why they have so little crime in Britain. Believe it or not, even in wartime, Wait, the Brits why they have so little crime with their neighbors. They have to. He's too damn close. That's why they have so little crime in Britain. Believe it or not, even in wartime, the British cop does not carry a gun. So nor does the professional crook. And in 1926, when the world heard of this stoppage of work in Britain, that industry, transportation, the whole life of the country had been paralyzed by a general strike, it was still more surprised next day to learn that the strikers were playing football with the cops. You can only understand that if you live in a sardine can. <laughs> I've heard somebody tell me about to that. this guy on our team. No part of Britain is more than a hundred miles from the sea. Wow. Every day for hundreds of years, years of peace and years of war, John Britain has seen ships sail from his island to the seven seas. That means that whenever... It is annoying me that he's saying John Britain. Like, I feel like that's a bit derogatory, but okay. You know, it's the 40s. Britain has seen ships sail from his island to the seven seas. That means that whenever John Britain wants to bust out of his sardine can, it's the sea that gets him. He's been busting out for hundreds of years. And that led to Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, Canada, and for that matter, the United States of America. This is, there is some truth to that. I've, I've had people from the UK tell me about that, like leaving comments saying, well, we're stuck on this small island, so why do you think we had the British Empire? But you guys can let me know, like, do you think that's accurate, what, what he's saying right here? How did John Britton get on our team? Remember 1938? The Yankees won the pennant. Wrong way, Corrigan. The last trains ran on the 6th Avenue L. Well, John Britton got excited about the same sort of things. The bet he had on the Derby, or, as he would say, the Derby. His job. His kids. Getting his exercise on his day off. Preston North End taking the football cup. Only 300 miles away, people were cheering another kind of event. Oh. And in London and every other British city and town, they read about what was going on in Europe, and they got sore about it. But they were also pretty well determined to keep it none of their business. Then, I'm sore about it. this looked bad. The Czechs had a mutual assistance pact with France. And France had won with Britain. This might mean war, even though everyone was anxious to avoid it. They'd been through one war, perhaps been wounded. 
Hundreds of thousands of their brothers and friends had been killed. I've never seen... Would you call that a cenotaph, I guess? A memorial of some sort? Showing an actual, like, dead body? Like, I don't think I've ever seen one before. They're always showing soldiers alive or something like that. That's, uh... That hits you differently. Hundreds of thousands of their brothers and friends had been killed. There was nothing beautiful to them about war, and they had no desire for another. In the last desperate effort to preserve peace, the Prime Minister today flew to Munich. All was well. Britain, France, Italy, and Germany were signing a pact at Munich, a pact in which the Germans agreed they had no further territorial claims to make. It was to be peace in our time. But it turned out to be a strange sort of peace. Hitler's first move was to break the pact he had signed. Wishful thinking was ended. Now they knew something had to be done about Germany. They approved the Conscription Act, the first peacetime conscription in British history, just as the Selective Service Act was the first in American history. The British had put their cards on the table. They had, in effect, said to Hitler, That's enough. If you go into Poland, we'll fight. Hitler smiled. Like other would-be conquerors of Britain, Philip of Spain, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, he thought he understood the British. He didn't. The sleeping lion began to wake up. <laughs> He was a pretty drowsy lion for the first six months of the war. He snapped and growled. But he dropped more leaflets than bombs. He hoped that common sense would return to the German Gosh. people and that they would throw out Hitler and the German warlords. Instead, countries of Luxembourg, Holland, and Belgium. The king of the Belgians today surrendered his armies of more than half a million men. Marshal Pétain, as French chief of state, has asked for an armistice. The issue in France is ended. Britain was alone. Czechoslovakia occupied, Poland defeated, Denmark gone, Norway gone, Holland, Belgium, France gone. Only Britain now. Britain was alone. Hitler considered the war over. Everybody considered the war over, except the British. At the 11th hour, the lion was finally aroused. We shall defend our island. Whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on beaches, landing grounds, in fields, in streets, and on the hills, it's Churchill. we shall never surrender. For a year, they took everything that the Nazis could throw at them. For one solid year, from June 1940 to June of 1941, they were the only major power fighting the greatest war machine in the world. Really thought about it like that about how britain was kind of alone in the fight but what, what about russia was russia not involved at this point yet i guess i guess russia russia was aligned with uh germany at this point technically they'd signed like a non-aggression pact i think i guess yeah britain would have been kind of alone they took body blow after body blow solid punches before they even had their guard up all they did was take it on the chin and hang on to the ropes they never went down. But what about the Anzacs? What about Australia and New Zealand at this point too? Like, what were they doing? And while they buried their dead, they prepared grimly and defiantly for the day when they could strike back. There were no victories to cheer them on. Just defeat after defeat. Some heroic, like the beaches of Dunkirk. 
or like the hills of Greece, where British soldiers landed to keep their pledge of honor to the Greek people. Landed knowing they were facing overwhelming odds, but some less glorious. Hong Kong and Singapore and Burma. But through all these long months, the British people were thinking and planning and working only for the day when they themselves could take the offensive. And that day came. to like military aviation and stuff. Can you guys let me know what planes these are? in greater and greater strength. That's in the air. And on the ground, 1,500 miles away in North Africa. think that North Africa is only 1500 miles away from Britain? I didn't I didn't think it was that close. That's like two-thirds of the width of the United States. <laughs> like that's about how far I am from Los Angeles right now. That's crazy. <laughs> building up to Americans come and save the day for the Brits. <laughs> Why do I feel like that's what's gonna happen with this? Seventeen hundred miles in one hundred and twenty-two days. Seventeen hundred miles of sand and wind and enemies. Once more, the people of Britain heard their church bells ring. More than three years earlier, they had been warned that this would be the signal of invasion. But long since, yeah. the nightmare of the threat of invasion had passed. Now the bells rang out a song of thanksgiving, a song of victory.
Now there is the plain and simple truth about Britain. But the fellow that calls the signals on the Axis team knows his only chance of winning is to split our team up. So his team plays a game at which they've had a lot of practice. A game which has conquered half a dozen countries for them. A game called Divide and Conquer. Men like these tell the British we aren't taking the war seriously. They tell the Russians we are letting them down. They tell the British the Russians will sell them out. And they tell us... It is manifestly ridiculous for the warmonger Roosevelt to tell the American people that they have anything in common with the British. On the contrary, they are different in every respect. Well, there are differences, that's true. For instance, we drive on the right side of the road. But in Britain, we go for baseball. They have a little number called cricket. It's a little number. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Implications of cricket is boring. And anyone who ever drank coffee over there knows why there'll always be an England. Is your coffee all right, sir? You don't know how to make coffee Give us a either. Glass of half and half. Have you heard about it, boys? Give us another glass of half and half. Blimey, you'd have thought it happened to poor old Bill. And another bloke here. So I went in to soak my dinner. But it's that in buckets and I was getting swatch. He loved that bad. They talk funny over there, too. And then Tchaikovsky's smaller piano fort works. I passed. Are they kidding, Jack? Why the cockamamie sprinkling from schmaltz mixed with celery tonic? Why do they all mush so much with corn cone in their mouth? You all can't understand a word they say. Yes, there are differences. Okay, to be fair though, I feel like this documentary is poking fun at American uh, slang and accents as well. So, both sides. But there are a few things that Britain and America do have in common. And these are the important things of life. A little thing called a free representative government. We call it Congress. They call it Parliament. A little thing called freedom of speech. No, in the next war, you've not got to go to it. They'll bring the war to you. And the thing is, if you take a tip from me, go and live at the Dorchester, because the trenches are just outside. This meeting is called on the office of the American Workers' Party, an organization dedicated to the organizing of the working class of America. Freedom of the press. Freedom of religion. They may not be important to Hitler, but all these things are the common heritage of John Q. Public and John Britton. 700 years ago, their ancestors fought for the Magna Carta. No one will we deny or delay right or justice. 300 years ago, the petition of right. No man shall be compelled to yield any tax without act of parliament. I mean, we are taught over here in, in, in uh, history in, in the U.S. about the Magna Carta and its importance in, like, future demo democracy and representative government. Like, it was kind of like, we're taught as kind of like the start of that sort of stuff. The, the U.S. has the Magna Carta to thank, laying the foundation of, of what we have today. That's kind of like what we're taught about it over here in the U.S. Now, obviously, there's probably a lot more to it than that, but that's the gist of it, you know. These principles came to our own country with the earliest settlers, and from them developed... Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. We may make gags about each other's accents, but we speak the same language of freedom. Even during the American Revolution, when we were at each other's throats, the Earl of Chatham was free to say about us to the British Parliament, You cannot but respect their cause and wish to make it your own. And that is why in the heart of London, alongside his great naval hero, Nelson, John Britton has put George Washington. Oh, what? And in Parliament Square... You guys have a statue of George Washington? Put George Washington. By Nelson? Why do you have a statue of George Washington? I mean, I know that he used to, like, fight in the British Army. I don't know. That's interesting. And in Parliament Square, the most sacred spot in the British Commonwealth of Nations, Abraham Lincoln. You have Abraham Lincoln? What? I didn't know you guys had these statues over there. 
that's an inch that's it's kind of blowing my mind right now i don't know why you would have them because they're not your national figures you know is it just to pay homage i like I don't know, you guys have to explain that to me. Why do you guys have Lincoln and Washington? I wonder, by the same token, if we have any, like, British... Statues of British heroes or whatever over here. Of course, Hitler doesn't like this kind of talk. His job is to sell the British that we are a nation of money grubbers. And gangsters. While in the next studio, he is selling us the idea that the British are gutless and dopes. The John Q. Public and John Britton are entirely different. All right, Hitler, where are these miners? Wales or West Virginia? These farmers, Devonshire or Wisconsin? These steel workers, Sheffield or Pittsburgh? These children, American or British, they live in lands which share the same hopes the same ideals, and unlike the poor children of Germany, in lands where the truth is free. But let's not kid ourselves. Britain is not the United States, and the United States is not Britain. For instance, we don't go in for this kind of thing. They do. But there's no mystery about that. Remember our grandmother's house? It was old-fashioned, out of date, patched and altered to suit each new generation, and filled with family relics even grandmother couldn't explain. Well, John Britton has been living in his house for a long time. And that's why to us, who live in a modern house that we built ourselves to suit ourselves, John Britton seems slow-moving and cluttered up with ancient traditions. Kings, for instance. The present king rode to his coronation in the same coach, to the same church, for the same ceremony as his ancestors did. But the job he took on is very different from theirs. There have been some changes made, for the British king can no longer make laws or impose taxes or interfere with government. He and his family work as hard as any other citizen, doing the job that the people expect of them. Today, the king is the servant of the people and not its ruler. I actually like that point that they made right there. It is very true. Britain is much, much it, on the surface. And well, not just on the surface. I mean, you guys have way more tradition than the United States does, obviously. For instance, part of parliament wearing the, the wigs and the robes and stuff. Like, that's, I mean, that's just keeping with tradition. We don't have that tradition here in the States. So yeah, it's different. When I think of Britain, I do think of obviously like older architecture, older infrastructure, you know, the houses you live in are sometimes hundreds of years old where, you know, here, you know, it's, you're probably living in a house that's maybe a few decades at most. I'm not saying Britain's not modern because it is, but you guys, like you said, just have way more tradition. But I think it, the the point about the king or the ro the royal family not having the power is a really important point to make in this in this documentary because i think you know americans were kind of just like indoctrinated with this idea of because of our founding and the way things were back then we have a very very negative view of monarchies and um, kings and queens and stuff and we kind of because of our experience with them during the American Revolution and stuff we don't really have a very good understanding of like constitutional monarchies like you guys have over in the UK and I'm still learning a lot about it but I I think that the point that he just made about them not having the power and being the servant of the people which I've learned from you guys in the UK a lot a lot you know in the comments on my videos you guys try to drive that point home with me because I don't think I full, had a full you know understanding or appreciation of it. I still don't, you know, like I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> it's a very hard thing for Americans to wrap our heads around. Uh, that's why I'm glad that they included included that information in this documentary. When an American is arrested and brought to trial, the bailiff calls his case. The people versus John Doe. But if such a case were called in Britain, it would be the king versus John Doe. It means the same thing. Today, the British king is the symbol of the people. The British are great fans of the fellow in Buckingham Palace, but when they sing, God save the king, they're not worrying about his health. 
They mean, God bless the British people. And the Dukes and the Earls. But in 1911, the people took away the last remaining power of the Lords to block the action of the people's representatives. Dukes and Earls don't run the country anymore. Today, there are only two people who do that. John Britton and his wife. They go to the polls, just as Mr. and Mrs. John Q. Public do here and elect their representatives to the House of Commons. And there they fix the taxes and make the laws. And if John wanted to get rid of the Lords, his representatives in Commons can at any time vote them out of existence. See, this is just like, this whole way of doing these is just so foreign to Americans because we don't, we don't have a monarchy, we don't have kings and queens, we don't have lords, we don't have dukes and earls and all of that stuff. So when that stuff still exists, then we don't understand how it all in integrates together. He kind of like explained it here and I've had a lot of you guys kind of teach me that over the last year or so. Through the videos on my channel. It's hard to really f fully understand a foreign government's process and the way they, they do things. It's something you really have to like study and learn. It is something that I would like to do um, because I, I don't know, I just find I find the way governments work pretty fascinating. I'm really impressed though this, that this uh, documentary, this propaganda film, is actually being pretty good at disseminating this information for Americans who may not understand it and trying to get them to understand, you know, how it actually is. A lot of Americans today probably need, actually need to watch this. But John doesn't want to get rid of them. So he confuses us by keeping dukes and lords yes. in a country where Unions have long been accepted as an essential part right. of the democratic system. It, it's very where confusing. The Labour Party, controlled by the unions, is one of the two great political parties, where longshoremen and railroad engineers have been ministers of the crown, and where for 30 years he has had a system of social security even more extensive than our own. So when you read about Lord Lewis Mountbatten or Lord Beaverbrook, former head of aircraft production, don't think they got their jobs because of their titles. They got them because they were the best men for the jobs. Just as Ernest Bevan, formerly a labor leader and now member of the War Cabinet, Herbert Morrison, who started life as an errand boy and is now Minister of Home Security, got their important jobs because they were the best men for them. With the things on the surface, the unimportant things, their John Britton and our John Q. Public differ. But the important part of their lives, they run the same way. The democratic way. The free way. But this gentleman never bothered about the truth. And when John Britton started carrying the war to Germany, he tried a new line. The war among a Churchill only wages this war against the German people to save the British Empire. All right, let's take a look at that one. Here's the British Empire. And here's where the Germans were headed when Britain declared war. Oh my gosh, let me, look, I've done videos on the British Empire and saw how extensive it was, but just, it never ceases to amaze me. When, look at all the flags everywhere. Crazy. The tiny, well, not tiny, I mean, it's, it's an island. Uh, an island country does that. That's, that's insane to me. British Empire. And here's where the Germans were headed when Britain declared war. Does that look like trying to save the empire? tackling Germany when it was headed into Poland and toward Russia, the one direction in which there were no British possessions. After Poland fell, Hitler hinted at peace with the British. This was the perfect chance to save the empire, but it wasn't saving the empire that the British were thinking about. The position yeah. of His Majesty's government in respect of any peace offer by Hitler we are not, in any circumstances, prepared to negotiate with him at any time on any subject. And after Britain had been on the losing end, month after month, it had another chance to save the empire. Even now, Hitler thought John Britain would make a deal. We heard the British answer. And let's take a look at this British Empire. 
Was Churchill speaking in the U.S. with that? Because we have um, NBC, CBS, Mike's here. I feel like I've asked this question before. I think I've seen this clip in the World at War, but I can't remember. It almost looks like he's speaking in Congress right there, but I'm not sure. There's U.S. flags. Did Churchill come over here to Washington and do a speech in Congress? And let's take a look at this British Empire. The freedom we fought for in 1776, Britain has since freely given to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. These are independent nations with their own parliaments, their own laws, even their own money systems, their own tariffs, which often work to Britain's disadvantage, their own armies and navies. Britain couldn't even take them into war if she wanted to. That's a problem they settled for themselves. Each one of the British Commonwealth of Nations declared war on Germany of its own free will. Of course, no one ever talks about the British Empire today without mentioning India. And men of goodwill in Britain as well as other countries have been outspoken in their demands for Indian freedom. For no man who believes in democracy can support foreign rule of any people. But there are things that many of us do not know about India. For instance, that India pays no taxes to Britain, either directly or indirectly. That the Indians fix their own tariff laws, frequently to Britain's disadvantage. That of the Viceroy's Executive Council, 11 of the 15 members are Indians. And in the courts, 10 of every 11 judges. Furthermore, that no Indian is ever conscripted for service in the Army and Navy. It was voluntary enlistment that raised the Indian Army from 170,000 at the outbreak of war to a million and a quarter today. And on the subject of India, listen to the words of Field Marshal Jan Christian Smuts. He fought against the British 40 years ago, was defeated in his fight, and still became the leader of one of the British Commonwealths of Nations, Prime Minister of South Africa. India, if she will, can be free in the same way and by the same means as Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are today free sovereign states. Their peoples worked out a constitution for themselves. The same course is open to India, if the peoples of India will agree about the terms of a free constitution. Freedom isn't a thing that can be imposed from without. It can only be created from within. The Indians have a responsibility to reconcile the differences that exist in the vast Indian population with its hundred different languages, its dozens of different religions. And on March the 11th, 1942, the British government placed itself on record and promised full self-government to India if India will work out a constitution that will satisfy its people after the war is over. Okay, my thing about this though is why are you dictating to India what they're supposed to do? Just let them be themselves, you know? Why do they have to conform to what Britain wants them to conform to? Look, I don't, I don't really, again, I've watched one video on, not that, just a few days ago actually, on India's role in World War II in, in relation to Britain. It was not kind to Britain at all. I mean, there was a lot of accusations, a lot of showed a lot of uh, not so great things that Britain did in India. It, sh it showed the Indian point of view, I guess, towards Brit, you know, the British, and it was pretty damning of the British. This video is the opposite of that. <laughs> it's showing all of the good stuff, you know, that Britain did. Now, both can exist, you know? Like, all of this stuff could have happened, and then all of this stuff in that other video could have happened as well. Like, there are good and there's a good and bad side to it, I guess. But still, it's kind of like, so you're gonna grant India freedom if they join together and resolve all of their cultural differences and come up with a constitution. Okay, what if they don't want that? Like, I, I don't know. I have, I have issues also with the U.S. interfering with other countries like that too. It's probably not a good idea to go in and mess with, with people's. I mean, people that have a completely different culture than you. Like, why are you trying to Westernize it? You know, it's, it's not. Not the way they do things. I can understand both sides of the coin, I guess, but still, I just, I don't know. There's just something about 
interfering with a, a country that's completely different from yours and trying to get them to do the to do things the way you do them. I just I don't know something about that just really irks me. And please don't take this as me criticizing Britain or anything like that. Like I criticize the United States in any country that does stuff like this. That's just kind of my view of it. There's some good things that come out of it. Like Britain, I'm sure brought some good things to India. The same way the United States, like recently in Afghanistan, like did some really positive things in that country, you know, but they had to do things our way in order to implement those things too. So it's just kind of the same situation in a lot of ways. <sighs> But during this war, military leaders agree Allied troops are needed in India as an effective block by the democratic world to keep the Nazis and Japs from uniting. Further, India provides the bases. Actually, I'd never heard that before, as they, they were using it as kind of like a, uh, a block to keep. Well, I, I mean, I don't know if that would have happened anyway, because Russia probably wouldn't have allowed Germany <laughs> to get past them. They didn't allow Germany to get past them. But still, I guess they didn't know that at the time. ...and Japs from uniting. Further, India provides the bases for United Nations bombers to get at the Japs in Burma. In other parts of the empire, too, democracy stands on guard. If it wasn't for the British at Gibraltar, Malta, Cyprus, Suez, Alexandria, and they're hanging on to them regardless of the cost, and their drive across Libya to Tripoli, there would have been no American landing in North Africa. Here come the Americans. There's another tune the Nazis play about the British Empire. The British are sitting back, letting others fight the war for them. Ooh, we know that tune very well. Britain will fight to the last Australian or Canadian or New Zealander. The truth that thousands of Canadians and Australians and New Zealanders have gallantly fought and gallantly died in Crete, in Greece, in Libya. But there's something the Nazi mouthpiece leaves out, something pretty important. Out of every ten inhabitants of the British Empire, one comes from Britain. But of the casualties suffered so far in this war, seven out of ten were born and raised in Britain. One of ten in population, seven of ten in casualties. And in the air, of the planes flying with the RAF in Britain, two out of three are manned by crews from the island. And of the planes on the overseas fronts, the western desert in Africa and the west, Four out of five are manned by boys from Britain. And then there's a little thing called the British Navy. From 1588, when it licked the Spanish Armada, to 1940, when we got moving on a two-ocean navy, the greatest battle fleet in the world, that too is manned almost entirely by men of Britain, the little island in the Atlantic, an island of seafarers. And the British Merchant Navy, Still the greatest merchant navy in the world, in spite of all that Hitler can do. Men from every British town and village in the stokeholds of 10,000 ships, on ice-coated decks, in grimy engine rooms, men who have been torpedoed twice, three times. sailor who's been torpedoed six times and still signed on again. <laughs> but we never hear about these things because of a curious character whose ways will never be completely understandable to an American. John Britton himself. He has an idea he shouldn't talk about himself and what he does. He calls it bad form. We call it damn silly. <laughs> He'd say of a spitfire, oh, she's not bad, little kite. But this man, the boss of the German Air Force, can tell us that the Spitfire has been the most deadly fighter in the world. And we certainly need an interpreter when this happens. Hello, Bob. Had a good trip? Oh, all right. All right.
except that he spent two days in the icy waters of the North Atlantic after being torpedoed on the way to Murmansk. See this man? His name is Whitten Brown. And this man, believe it or not, is the first man who flew the Atlantic nonstop. In 1919, eight years before anyone else, he and John Alcock flew nonstop from Newfoundland to Ireland. But as usual, the British let it go at that, and Whitten Brown went back into obscurity. There's nothing wrong with John Britton that a correspondence course in showmanship wouldn't cure. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That is true though. I've I've learned that um, mostly like when I watched the Remembrance Day, Festival of Remembrance actually. It was very apparent to me like just how patriotic the British are, you know, and how proud they are of their military and stuff. They definitely displayed it in that Festival of Remembrance and in Remembrance Day ceremonies and stuff. You see it. It's, it's just a different way of going about it. Americans are very vocal about, you know, ourselves, I guess. Which is annoying to a lot of people, I guess, around the world. We like to be a bit more boastful, I think, than, you know, the Brits do. It's just a cultural difference. And I think there's some misunderstanding that comes with that. For a moment, imagine that you're not American, but British. You'd still be in uniform. For in Britain, every man between the age of 18 and 41, unless he cannot be replaced at a vital workbench, is already in uniform. Your old man, too. He's had to quit gassing about the last war, for they're now starting to draft men up to 51. Dependents or no dependents. If you've got yourself into this mess, your draft board will say, frightfully sorry, old chap, but you're in the army anyway. And your kid sister, if she isn't a sailor, or in the Air Force, or the Land Army, or a ferry pilot, or in the fire brigade, she's probably in the army, for they've drafted unmarried women up to 30. First 9,000! And even if she's married, every woman up to 41 can be drafted to work in war plants. And it's a real draft for 8 million workers, men and women, can't quit their jobs or be fired without government permission. Britain is only 20 miles from German guns and German planes. Everybody, man or woman, young or old, is in the front line. 20 miles also is insane. Like, I just recently learned that from watching Dad's Army. In the last episode of Dad's Army, they thought that they had accidentally crossed the, um, the English Channel in a rowboat. <laughs> and I learned that it was like 20 miles. Like, the, the channel was only like, tw well, I don't know if I learned it from that episode, but it was reinforced that it was only like 20 something miles from Germany and I don't think uh, most Americans have an idea of just how big the English Channel to us it seems bigger than that just just like in my mind's eye I think about it it's got to be like a hundred miles like it's it feels way farther away than just like 20 miles because on the map it's hard to tell you know just looking at it so but 20 miles is nothing that's from one side of a city to another basically Maybe this isn't your idea of Britain. The ads were different, and you wondered whether they still made bows and arrows at the village forge. The ads kept quiet about industry, just as this one leaves out the aircraft plants and the oil fields. <laughs> well, they have the rich green fields you've read about, the quiet country lanes, but they also have the steel mills of Sheffield, the Pittsburgh of Britain. They have the picturesque little villages, the gently flowing streams, the lovely old castles. But they also have the shipyards of the River Clyde, not as modern as Henry Kaiser's, but still one of the greatest in the world. They have the old cathedrals, deathless reminders of a rich tradition. But they also have the great industrial cities of Birmingham, Glasgow, Manchester, Leeds, 
they seldom if ever saw an american tourist but they made britain even in peacetime one of the greatest industrial powers in the world i love how like back then they weren't concerned at all about like all the pollution <laughs> like the great industrial centers and then it shows just like a ton of just pollution in the air the united states has horrible pollution from stuff like this too like i've driven past part like industrial parts of cities and you can't even breathe like the air is so bad i'm not sure about britain or whatever but but i love how like back then it's just like it's no big deal and in wartime even as late as july 1942 this little island no larger than the state of idaho was making more war goods than we were Maybe you thought John Britton sat there and waited for us to send him planes and guns and tanks. Well, he's deeply grateful for what our Lend-Lease did for him. It saved his skin when he was in a tough spot. But today, Lend-Lease works in more ways than one. For today, John Britton himself furnishes planes and guns and tanks through the same Lend-Lease to us, to Russia, and his other allies all over the world. In Britain alone, our forces have received, free from the British, a million and a half tons of food, clothing, and munitions, and two and a half million tons of other materials. There's another thing you ought to know about Britain. If your unit gets sent there, you probably won't be invited out for supper or for a drink. That's not because the British don't want to entertain you. They haven't anything to entertain you with. Britain is mobilized for war, total war, and that means an end to civilian supplies. If you were a Britisher, you wouldn't expect your girl to use lipstick. Britisher? There isn't any, except what we bring over as bait. Oh my God. She wouldn't be smartly dressed for clothes or rationed, severely rationed. It's very unlikely she wears stockings, for if she bought a pair of stockings a month, that would be all the clothes of any kind she could buy. I learned at Horrible Histories, so that's another thing I'm watching over on Patreon, that they used to like, uh, put like gravy on their legs instead of stockings, because they didn't have, they didn't have stockings. It's just disgusting. I, I don't think I could do that. That's some rationing. We think our gas rationing is tough, but John Britton gets no gas at all. He goes to a pub to buy a bottle of whiskey. The pub keeper laughs in his face. Grain is needed for industrial alcohol. Industrial alcohol is needed for munitions. And nearly all the reserve stock of British whiskey is kept for sale to America to pay for the goods Britain buys here. Oh. For don't forget, besides Lend-Lease, Britain buys and pays for vast quantities of goods. And it was the cash purchases that Britain made before we entered the war that gave our munitions industry its start and enabled us to build it up in record time. He goes to buy a pack of cigarettes. There probably aren't any. But if there are... Two shillings, please. That's 40 cents for a pack of cigarettes. 12 cents represent the cost of the cigarettes. The other 28, the tax paid to the government. For Britain is going all out in taxation. Nobody is making any money out of this war. Industry is paying. Excess profits tax is 100%. Labor is paying. The man who earns $33 a week pays 29% income tax. And the rich man, if there are any of them left, pays an income tax of no less than 97.5%. Oh, my God. And then there's the little matter of food. There are not many fat men in England nowadays. But John Britton isn't kicking. He knows one egg a week is helping him to win the war. The British rations are the rations of a free people. They could get food as they did in peacetime from Canada, Australia. But that would take ships. And the British prefer to use the ships for supplies to Russia, planes from America, troops to the Mediterranean. To win the war, Every Britisher is on short rations, and has been on short rations for two years. Everybody except the children. They get four times the eggs that grown-ups do. They get all the oranges that arrive in Britain, and practically all of the extra milk. For John Britton is thinking of after the war, of the new world that his children and ours will inherit. 
a world where there will not only be freedom of speech and freedom of worship, but also freedom from want and freedom from fear. It is not given to us to peer into the mysteries of the future. Still I avow my hope and faith, sure and inviolate, that in the days to come, the British and American peoples will for their own safety and for the good of all walk together in majesty, in justice, and in peace. This is what the British are fighting for. They are an old people, a stubborn people, and sometimes they have moved slowly. But in three years of blood and sweat and tears, John Britton has found his soul. <laughs> is tough. Now he is determined and now he knows where he is marching, to victory and to a new world. He's a good man to have on our team. That was not what I was expecting this to be. Actually, I, for some reason, I thought it was going to be one of those, like, propaganda films in the sense that America came, you know, came to the rescue and, and saved Britain and all of that stuff. So I, I thought that that's genuinely, genuinely, like, where it was gonna go. But I actually found this to be, like, anti-propaganda. Felt like it was more truthful than anything. Now, you guys can, in the UK can let me know. And obviously, it has some kind of silly stuff in there. And maybe some of it was a bit stereotyping. <laughs> I don't know, but overall though, I was really, really impressed. And I don't know, like I feel like uh, Amer like American, like people today could probably watch this and get something out of it. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments, um, whether you thought that this was a pretty accurate depiction of things. Yeah, I'm just curious to hear from Americans and Britons, you know, what you guys think about it. And if you did enjoy it like I did, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe it if you haven't done that yet. I do do uh, a lot of content on the UK, you know, military in Europe it just like just trying to learn about a bunch of different stuff around the world and I enjoy having you guys in the comments kind of teaching me and guiding me along the way. I also have links to all my social media down in the description and pinned comment. I do have a Patreon which I've mentioned a couple of times in this video where I, I do like videos over there on Patreon. Like I mentioned Dad's Army, Black Adder, The World at War. I just horrible histories. I do all of that stuff over on Patreon because I can't do it over here on YouTube. So if you're interested in any of that, you can go check it out. The link is in the description and pinned comment. I also have a Star Trek podcast for all of you Trekkies out there. That link is also in the description and pinned comment. I also have a PO box in the description if you're looking for that. Anyway, more stuff like this to come. Roger, Scarlet, and I were Scarlet. There's Scarlet! She's waiting for me to take her on a walk. Anyway, we thank you guys for watching as always, and uh, we'll see you next time.